Before I explain what powerarchy is, I'm going to start out with some examples of what powerarchy looks like. And I'd like to start with a quote from someone you've probably heard of that says, we could understand our people not being classed with whites, but to be placed on the same level as the natives, these are darker skinned people, seem too much to put up with. Natives, as a rule, are uncivilized. They are troublesome, very dirty, and live like animals. We are infinitely superior to natives. Now, who do you think said this? If you guessed Gandhi, you guessed correctly. And now here is another example. I'd like you to imagine the following scenario. These are Joe and Brenda, hypothetically. Joe and Brenda are students and they're also a couple. Now, Brenda proudly tells Joe that she got a B plus on her recent exam, to which Joe replies, why are you so excited? I mean, it's not like it was an A. To which Brenda then replies, well, at least I didn't get a C on my freshman final. To which Joe then replies, well, at least I didn't fail out of statistics last semester, and so on. Does this sound familiar at all to you? Have you experienced this personally, any of you? Probably seen this and experienced this many times. So the question is, why are people who care about each other nevertheless hurting each other? Now here's another example of powerarchy. I know that the vast majority of people in this room are no doubt vegan. And I'm fairly certain that there are some people in this room, as there always are, who are not vegan. For those of you who are not vegan, imagine that you're at a dinner party. Some of you have heard this example before. You're eating a delicious beef stew to you, and you ask your host for the recipe. And she replies, saying the secrets in the meat. You need to use well-seasoned golden retriever. Now think about how you would react. Now a final example is uh, an example actually that comes from Michael Singer's book called The Untethered Soul. In his book, Michael Singer says to imagine how you would feel. Imagine you have a roommate who follows you everywhere you go. And this roommate is, shares an incessant stream of mostly negative commentary on everything you experience. They criticize your choices, they tell you all the reasons you should be constantly worried, they put you down by calling you names like lazy and stupid, they tell you you're not good enough and you probably never will be, and so on. How would you feel? Michael Singer says that this is no different than the voice in our head. This is the inner roommate that we all have within our minds, our inner roommate who follows us wherever we go. How many of you can relate to this? Quite a few people, right? Probably everybody in this room. Now, these examples I've shared all look like different situations, and in some ways they are, but they all have a common denominator. What do you think this common denominator is? They all reflect relationships. In fact, they reflect a particular way of relating that reflects a particular type of thinking or a mentality. They reflect relationships. Relationships between, for example, Gandhi and um, the so-called natives, between the meat consumer and the animal who is once consumed, between you and yourself. Now, to help explain this phenomenon that I'm talking about, I'd like you to think of a relationship in your life that you would consider a good, even a great relationship. Take a moment and just imagine that relationship. Now, think about how you feel in this relationship. In particular, think about your feeling of connection. Do you feel connected in the relationship? Think about your feeling of dignity. That's your sense of inherent worth. Do you feel like a fundamentally worthy person in this relationship? Does the other person treat you in a way that you feel honors your dignity? You feel good about yourself. Now think about the other person's behavior. Does it reflect integrity? In other words, do they treat you in a way that reflects compassion or caring about you and justice, treating you fairly? And finally, think about your sense of empowerment. How easy is it for you to be your better self in this relationship? 
Now, I'd like you to think of a relationship that's not such a great relationship. Maybe it's a really lousy relationship. Maybe it's with a person you're no longer in relationship with. Maybe it's somebody you've only met online, like a troll. And now think about your sense of connection. Do you feel connected or disconnected? Do you feel fundamentally worthy? How do you feel about your dignity? Does this person treat you with integrity? How easy it, is it for you to be your better self? Do you find that you have to work to actually be the self you know you could be and you want to be? You know what I'm talking about? So take a minute and think about these feelings and this, these experiences. Each of these relationships basically falls on a different side of the relational spectrum. Relationships and interactions, which are like mini relationships, can basically be more or less relational. They can be more or less healthy. They can violate integrity and harm dignity, or they can honor, practice it, reflect integrity and honor dignity. Relationships can cause us to feel more disconnected, or more connected. And we know that we human beings and also other animals are in fact wired for connection. We actually seek meaningful connection and we strive to avoid the pain of disconnection. We also know that we are wired for empathy and that feeling empathy tends to increase the chances that we will act in ways that enhance connection. And finally, we know that healthy relational behaviors are fundamental to the well-being of individuals and also of societies. But when you look at the world, you can see that non-relational ways of being prevail. So the question for us is what's getting in the way of us relating the way that we want and need to? What is it that's causing this relational paradox whereby we create the very thing that we want to avoid? Now, I have been pondering this question for a very long time. In fact, my mother told me that I was born old. I'm not kidding and she did not say that as a compliment. Um, but seriously, the catalyst for me to start thinking about this issue started a very long time ago um, when I was a, a young child on my father's fishing boat. Um, and in fact, this is probably why my father says that it's his fault that I turned into an activist. My father, the Republican fisherman. I used to love going on my father's boat. It was the, my favorite place in the world to be. Until one day when I was about four years old, I caught my first and last fish. And when I caught this fish, my parents were so excited and they ran up to me and they were cheering me on and they were pulling the fish out of the water with me. But I couldn't feel excitement. I couldn't feel what they were feeling. I felt kind of numb, kind of sad. And when I look back now, I realize I felt guilty. My young mind was, could not reconcile what I was experiencing at that time. And my father's boat, which was my fa had been my favorite place to be, became a source of distress and I stopped going on it. And seafood, which had been my favorite cuisine, suddenly sickened me to the point where I vomited just at the very smell of it. I just couldn't reconcile how caring people, my parents nonetheless, could harm others and neither see nor feel troubled by this contradiction. I mean, my parents instilled in me a strong commitment to practicing the golden rule, to treating others the way I would want to be treated if I were in their position. And this, of course, extended to the way that we treat other animals. I mean, our dog was treated like a member of the family. And yet, everywhere I turned, I witnessed this violation of this supposedly highest principle, not only toward animals, and also, but also toward humans. For example, as um, a child in the 1970s who was raised by um, a single mother who didn't have enough money to pay for our school lunches, we got food stamps for lunches, my brother and I. Um, and I couldn't afford new clothes when I went to school. And this made me a prime target for bullies who would taunt me and call me poor and disgusting, right in plain sight of unconcerned teachers. And as a young woman growing up in the 1980s, 
Men would yell out their car windows. I experienced this practically pretty much on a daily basis. Men would yell out their car windows at me, saying all the things that sexual things they wanted to treat me to. And when I ignored them to manage my anxiety, they would call me a bitch or worse. And like many women in that day, I was basically harassed on pretty much a daily basis. So I witnessed this relational paradox in these ways and so many more. And I pondered it. But it wasn't until something extreme happened that I actually started actively searching for an answer to it. And as it turned out, it was another encounter with an animal, this time in the form of a hamburger. I ate a hamburger in 1989 that led me to get so sick, I was hooked up to intravenous antibiotics in the hospital, and I just stopped eating meat after that. Not for any like ethical reasons, at least not to my conscious awareness, but because I was just disgusted by the last food that I had eaten. And so I started looking for you know ways to cook my new diet, which was vegetarian and then quickly became vegan. Um, and this information, this search for information, led me to discover information about animal agriculture, of course. And what I learned shocked and horrified me. I could not believe the global atrocity that had been going on all around me, that, but that I had effectively chosen not to see. What shocked me perhaps even more was that nobody I talked to about what I learned was willing to hear what I had to say. They would say things like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal, or they'd call me a crazy vegan hippie propagandist. And I just couldn't understand how rational, caring people like I had been, of course, could turn away from atrocities. Why did people resist the very information that would enable, enable them to act on their caring, that would, it would enable them to foster the meaningful connections that we all seek? So I enrolled in a doctoral program in psychology, and I studied the psychology of violence and nonviolence, and I, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating animals, uh, which led to the publication of my best-selling book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, An Introduction to Carnism. But my research actually led me to discover something far broader than just the psychology of eating animals. I identified the psychological mechanisms, the mentality that drives all oppression and abuse as well as how this mentality informs and is informed by external social structures. I, I essentially had sort of a blueprint with which to understand the deeper psychological drivers of oppression and abuse. Now, usually when oppression is examined by scholars and by activists, it's through the lens of economics or politics or philosophy or sociology, and of course, these lenses matter. They each help us see a different aspect of oppression. But we also need to look at oppression through the lens of relationships. Because what my research and the research of others that I've built on, most notably uh, relational cultural theorists, shows is that on a deeper level, oppression is a relational phenomenon. Oppression reflects and reinforces relational dysfunction, a dysfunction in how we relate as groups, social groups, um, to other individuals, to other animals, to the environment, and also to ourselves. What this means is that unless we change the way we relate, we cannot end oppression. Now, I realize that this oppressive or, or non-relational mentality is based on a core belief, the belief in a hierarchy of moral worth, that some individuals or groups are more worthy of moral consideration of being treated with compassion and justice than others. So just think about Gandhi's statement. Gandhi only argued that the natives should be treated differently than the Indians because he believed the natives were less worthy of moral consideration. On some level, it was because he believed that they were morally inferior. 
And I realized that this mentality didn't exist in a vacuum. When so many individuals have the very same belief, it is very likely that it's the product of a widespread belief system. So, for example, the belief that males are more worthy of moral consideration than females or people of other genders reflects the widespread belief system of sexism. And the belief that humans are more worthy of moral consideration reflects the widespread belief system of speciesism. I thus came to identify the belief system that I call powerarchy. Powerarchy is a non-relational system that is structured to foster attitudes and behaviors that violate integrity and harm dignity, thus leading to disconnection and disempowerment. Powerarchy is based on the belief in a hierarchy of moral worth. And as its name suggests, it is based on exercising power over others. In other words, we learn under powerarchy, we learn to derive our sense of power and worth from having more than others, from wielding power over others. The example of the students is a perfect illustration of what I'm talking about. You all know what I'm talking about because you've lived this over and over and over again in your life. All of us who are born into a dominant powerarchical system know exactly what it feels like to be on the lower end of powerarchical behaviors and also on the, on the other end of it. So these students, for example, one puts the other down and then the other retaliates by putting that person down and back and forth and so on and so forth. They have learned that the way to manage to feel better about their own self, sense of self-worth is by, by finding or creating others who they can perceive as less worthy, as less than they are. And when we seek to have more power than others, we inevitably create power imbalances between us. And indeed, powerarchy is structured to maintain and off often grow these power imbalances, in particular, unjust power imbalances. Because some power imbalances are actually not unjust. Um, like, for example, the imbalance between a, pa a parent and a child. So, for example, think about the power imbalance between men and people of other genders and women, or the power imbalance between humans and non-human animals, or between that of an abusive partner and of the partner being abused. And of course, most people would not willingly support powerarchy, since the system runs counter to the values that we all hold dealer, values of compassion and justice. And powerarchy causes the very outcomes we all really want to avoid. We seek, we need meaningful connection, and yet powerarchy drives us to create the opposite outcomes. So most of us would never willingly support a system such as powerarchy. So the system the system needs to use a set of defense mechanisms, psychological and social defense mechanisms, so that we act against our compassion and our justice, we act against our natural drive to connect without realizing what we're doing. In other words, the system is structured to prevent us from both seeing it or challenging it if we do catch on. And it does this primarily by using myths and using privileges. Now, myths are stories. They are stories that um, tell us that the powerarchy uh, or things within the powerarchy are the way they should be. For example, we learn to believe that male dominance is normal, natural, and necessary, or that heterosexual supremacy is normal, natural, and necessary, or that eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary, or that exercising power and control over our domestic partner is normal, natural, and necessary. And what these myths do, um, they do many things, but one of the key things they do is that they disconnect us from our natural emotional responses to injustice, to cruelty. They disconnect us from our empathy when we're in a position of power. 
When we're a power holder, for example, when we're a male in patriarchy, which is a powerarchy, we don't feel empathy as much as we otherwise might for those who are impacted by the privilege, the power that we have. So they disconnect us from our empathy when we're in a position of power, and they disconnect us from our anger when we're in a position of less power. So, for example, when people are in relationships that are abusive or controlling, very often they learn that it's not safe to feel and express their anger, and very often what they do is they stuff their anger down and disconnect from it. They don't even realize they feel it. How many times have you heard, for example, somebody in a relationship who's not being treated with respect saying, well, I guess I just need to try harder. I guess I just need to be better. Anger is the healthful and appropriate response to injustice. When we're disconnected from our anger, we lose the power that would encourage us to stand up against injustice for ourselves or for others. And often when people are on the lower end of a powerarchy, instead of anger, what do you think they feel? What is the emotion they feel instead? Right, shame, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, privileges are advantages that are given to some groups or individuals, but not to others, that help maintain the power imbalance. So, for example, men can run for political office without having their gender be a part of their platform. Um, they can walk in public, for the most part, without fear of harassment. At least um, cisgender, heterosexual men can. Heterosexuals can marry, not be diagnosed as mentally ill, start a family without having to justify their choice. Humans can own, buy, sell, and eat other animals. Animals have virtually no rights, um, no privileges. And an abusive partner can say or do what they want without having to justify their behavior. And all forms of oppression share these same features. So it can be helpful to think of oppressions as spokes on a wheel with powerarchy as the hub. Powerarchy is like the meta system. It's like the overarching system that informs all oppressive and abusive systems and dynamics. And powerarchy exists across all three relational dimensions. Um, on the collective or social level, on the interpersonal level between individuals, and on the intrapersonal level, how we relate to ourselves. And it also informs, as I said before, how we relate to other animals and to the environment. It's a holistic system in that sense. So powerarchies can, for example, be systems of oppression, such as racism and sexism. They can be uh, abusive relationships or dysfunctional work cultures. Now, of course, some forms of impression inform others. For example, sexism and heterosexism and genderism are all informed by or stem from the broader system of patriarchy, just as anti-Semitism stems from or is informed by the broader system of racism, and carnism stems from the broader system of speciesism. And some forms of oppression intersect with each other, uh, creating distinct social categories. So for example, somebody who is a woman and a person of color then falls into the category a woman of color and experiences a distinct form of oppression. Um, this is what intersectionality is focused on. And while it's essential to become aware of the various forms and expressions of oppression, it's not enough to just determine who is oppressing whom. We need to look at why and how we oppress. Specifically, we need to examine the deeper relational processes, the attitudes and behaviors that drive oppression and the social structures that reflect and reinforce them. We need to understand the mentality of powerarchy if we ever hope to create the kind of world and relationships and movements that we all ultimately want to be a part of. Treating the symptoms of oppression without targeting the cause is like 
taking an aspirin to treat the flu when what we actually need is an antibiotic. And we can then end up actually masking the disease, which worsens and spreads to others. And in fact, powerarchy is contagious. Proponents of nonviolent social change have long argued that if we use violence to fight violence, we'll end up with more of the same. And this is not just some philosophical ideal. This is not some abstraction. This is a scientific reality. It is supported by science, this idea that powerarchy is contagious. Studies, for example, have shown that when people feel that their dignity is harmed, they become defensive. This means they are less connected with their rationality, they're less likely to think rationally, they're less connected with their executive functioning, and they are less likely to feel empathy. They're more likely to act against what we're act asking them to do. Um, and they're more likely to react powerarchically toward us or toward others. So studies have shown, for example, that when somebody, when, when you practice power over towards somebody else, that person is more likely to give it right back to you with power over. And even if they don't, they're also more likely to do that to another person they encounter, maybe later in the day. Studies have also shown that people automatically act and think powerarchically when they have power. So for example, when somebody's in a position of power, they're a boss, they're a white person, for example, and they're relating to somebody with less power, they're less connected to their empathy for that other individual. They're more likely to feel entitled to do things that they don't believe the other person is also entitled to do. They are more likely to think and act powerarchically. Some researchers have even said that such behaviors, quote, spread like the common cold. So powerarchy is contagious and it's everywhere. Just consider how systems that were created to challenge powerarchy like social justice movements, can start becoming mini powerarchies as more and more proponents use powerarchy to show that powerarchy is wrong. So many of us are working toward change on the level of content, on the what, but our process, our how, is powerarchical. We speak out for justice while acting in ways that are unjust. When we flip the ladder of powerarchy, we just end up with more of the same. And we can end up becoming the very thing we're trying to transform. It can be helpful to think of the powerarchical mentality as an entity that's taken up residence in your psyche. This entity has a survival instinct. It wants to keep itself alive. And the way it does this is by getting you to find a morally inferior other. And no matter how well-intentioned you may be, powerarchy will try to trick you into creating this other. It will come up with all sorts of justifications for why you shouldn't practice integrity towards someone else. The justification du jour is because we're morally outraged. Because once somebody has done something we consider unethical, we feel justified in carrying out power over behaviors toward them, in disrespecting them. Now, one way you can tell that you're under the influence of the powerarchical mentality is if you feel the emotions of either contempt or shame. These are relational emotions. They only exist in relation, in relationship. They only exist in comparison. We feel contempt or we feel shame when we're comparing ourselves to another or to an idealized or demonized version of ourselves. When you feel contempt, that's a sign that you've placed yourself in a position of moral superiority. And when you feel shame, that's a sign that you are experiencing yourself in a position of moral inferiority. And the antidote to both of these is empathy. 
It is difficult, if not impossible, for example, to look down on another when we're actually looking at the world through their eyes. Now, contempt and shame both result from the same belief, from the same myth. Contempt and shame result from believing in the myth of a hierarchy of moral worth, that we can be better or worse on a fundamental level. We have more or less intrinsic value than another or than an idealized version of ourselves. And this is a myth, of course. If you think about it rationally, each one of us is simply a product of our hard wiring, the brain and body we were born with, and every single experience we have ever had in our lives. We're nothing more nor less than this. How could we be? Expecting others or ourselves to be different from who and how we are is like expecting a tree that's been rained on not to be wet. I feel quite certain that if I had been born into the body and environment of Ted Bundy, that I would not have become an advocate for compassion as I am today. In fact, to feel and advocate compassion is a privilege. This does not mean that we don't hold others accountable and that we don't work to change problematic behaviors. Of course we do. It simply means that we do so without harming dignity. We do so without feeding the epidemic of powerarchy. So, given all of this, what is the solution? How do we work toward the transformation of powerarchy? Since the problem is caused by non-relational ways of being, the solution needs to be focused on cultivating healthy relationality. In other words, we need to develop relational literacy, the understanding of and ability to relate healthfully. It never ceases to amaze me that most of us have no choice but to learn complicated geometry that we will probably never need to use, and yet we never get a single formal lesson on how to be healthy relational individuals. And when you look at the problems of our world today, these are not problems that are caused by people who don't know how to do geometry. And on top of this, we have been born into a deeply dysfunctional world. It's like we are continuously, we are still living in the relational dark ages. Frankly, I'm amazed that we make it through the day half the time. So I'm not surprised, you know, that we keep recreating relational dysfunction. It makes sense given where we're at at this point in time. And the good news is that each of us has the capacity to become much more relational. I believe so strongly in the importance of relational literacy to help transform our lives and our world that I've actually written an entire book on it. Um, this will be out in January 2020, Getting Relationships Right. And a couple of tips that you can use right now to improve your own relationality is to pause when interacting with others, to pause when communicating with others, and ask yourself these questions. Does my behavior reflect integrity, compassion, and justice? Before you hit send, ask yourself that. Imagine the person on the other end of the communication. How might they feel? And ask yourself, does the other's behavior toward me reflect integrity? Is this person interacting with me in a way that feels respectful to me? Now, since communication is the primary way we relate, a key component of developing relational literacy is learning effective communication. And, and one tip to do, you know, you can start right now, as Rumi said, it's just to remember when you're communicating, to ask yourself, is what is being communicated true? Simple question, but so important. Do I know this to be true? And is it kind? Make this the basis for communication. If you don't know the answers to these, keep looking before engaging in the communication. 
Now, ultimately, developing relational literacy requires cultivating mindfulness. Mindfulness is both a state and a practice. Mindfulness is the state of being aware and present in the moment, and it's the practice of becoming more aware and present. Mindfulness is actually the true opposite of powerarchy. Powerarchy reflects and reinforces unawareness. And mindfulness reflects and reinforces awareness, self-awareness, awareness of others, awareness of the world. Mindfulness uh, or powerarchy reflects and reinforces, cultivates confusion and these cognitive distortions, denials and mythology, um, whereas mindfulness cultivates clarity. Powerarchy creates and reflects anger and fear. Mindfulness brings us into a state of calmness. Powerarchy causes us to feel apathetic. Mindfulness connects us with our empathy. Powerarchy leads to cruelty, and mindfulness leads to compassion. Powerarchy disconnects us from ourselves, others, and the world, and mindfulness connects us to ourselves, others, and the world. There are lots of ways to practice mindfulness and to cultivate mindfulness. Meditation is probably the, is the primary way to do this. One thing you can do right now is to commit to developing your inner observer. Your inner observer is that part of you that is always there, that has always been there, that is observing your experience, observing as you move through the world. It's the part of you that is objective and compassionate. It's not creating stories and it's not reacting to what's happening. It's just noticing with compassion. One way you can work to cultivate your inner observer besides meditating um, is to set your alarm to go off several times throughout the day and then pause for a minute, pause and look inside. Ask yourself, what am I thinking right now? What is that voice in my head saying? What's the story it's telling me about this other person, about myself, about this experience? What am I thinking? Don't judge it, just notice it. Be compassionate toward yourself. And ask yourself, well, what am I feeling right now? What's happening inside of me? What do I notice? Your inner observer is like a muscle. The more you practice it, the more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. Ultimately, we can use our minute-to-minute -minute relational dynamics relating with ourselves and relating with others as a training ground on which to cultivate greater integrity in our lives and bring greater integrity into our world. So it's time to move beyond powerarchy. Now, to do this, we need to make our relationships and our movements safe spaces where integrity is practiced and dignity is honored. Even as we may disagree on ideas, on tactics, on ideology, and on money, many other issues, even as we may hold people accountable for problematic behaviors. And especially for those of, this, those of us who are working for social transformation, we need to stop fighting each other and commit to healthy relating, or we risk cannibalizing ourselves. If we spent half the time learning how to be more relational, as we do looking for examples of how others and ourselves aren't good enough, aren't moral enough, berating vegans who aren't vegan enough, or environmentalists who drive too much, or progressives who don't use the right words when they're talking about privilege, if we spent half the time focusing instead on cultivating healthy relationality in ourselves, we would very likely transform our movements within a matter of months. So it's time to say no to powerarchy. And it's time to commit to cultivating healthy relationality. So we can make our movements the most powerful force for justice and compassion that they need to be and that they can be. Thank you.